So welcome everybody to our podcast in the series Leading in a Climate Changed World. It's an enormous pleasure and privilege today to welcome Dr. Gail Bradbrook to talk with us. Gail is the co-founder of the international social movement Extinction Rebellion and she grew up in Yorkshire in England, the daughter of a coal miner. She went on to study molecular biophysics at the University of Manchester and completed a PhD there before carrying out postdoctoral work in India and in France. From 2003 to 2017, she was Director of Strategy at Citizens Online and has had various different roles there and currently works as a consultant to that organization. And that organization promotes wider internet access for disabled users, including uh, a Fix the Web campaign that she launched in November 2010. Gail has been involved in various campaigning groups in Stroud in England, including a period from 2010 to 2013 as voluntary director of Transition Stroud, an anti-fracking protest, various actions in opposition to the building of a local incinerator, and she's also been involved in tax justice campaigns and many other issues of, of social importance. And then in 2015, with George Bader, she set up the group Compassionate Revolution, that in turn morphed into rising up, out of which came Extinction Rebellion. So now she is very focused on that, protesting to raise awareness of the dangers from anthropogenic climate change, and believes that only civil disobedience on a large scale can bring about the change that is needed. So Gail, huge thank you and welcome today to talk with us about leadership and the climate change world. And I think it'd be great if you would just describe a little bit what, what's taken you on that journey, also particularly through these last three iterations that end up in Extinction Rebellion and kind of what the focus is now for your, your passion and your work. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess one of the things I always think when you read that list out is that I see a lot of what I've done in the past as being largely a failure. <laughs> Each thing that I tried had a, a much bigger ambition than what it achieved and it's always been an inquiry into issues of social injustice economic and environmental problems and wanting to see a change and trying to figure out how things change so within that there, there's sometimes you lack information sometimes you lack context sometimes you bring in a part of yourself that's not useful so at each stage you're learning something uh about that processes of, of uh, so it's about leadership in some ways isn't it it's about becoming a, a stronger leader so i feel like i've learned an enormous amount from that journey and i once read somewhere that social entrepreneurs are people that fail a lot which reassures <laughs> me greatly and it's always about staying humble isn't it we're here in service and not to um yeah and i i whenever we're successful i mean i'm like the the, the last who wrote eat pray love and she talked about genius and she said um it's not something that you are it's something that pays a visit so there's there's something here about working with uh leadership and quality when you can bring that forward the the, the more recent iterations were about there was something about branding but there was also something about trying to so compassionate revolution as much as it's a, a brand that i really love is doesn't speak to lots of people so you know you read george lakoff don't think of an elephant and he talks about the six different progressive left types and that would speak very strongly to what you might call spiritual activists but the rest of people are going to think what's this about so there's something of branding and there was something of finding a team of people to work with and co-creating something. So Rising Up with, is a network that's looked at various campaigns. So there's been hunger strikes on the steps of the Labour Party about Heathrow. Uh, there's been and also actions at Heathrow Airport itself. There have been things around uh, inequality in the London School of Economics to do with the pay of cleaners. There's been a focus on, on, on banking and uh, democracy and so it did a whole spectrum of things and I guess that the purpose there was to uh, test out some ideas and to come together as a team and then in April last year uh, well it was January last year when Roger Hallam proposed that we focused on climate change 
and some of us were concerned that a we weren't quite ready as a network and b how that could deal into eco-fascism if it's done badly and that's still a concern that in actual fact uh and then um the 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 um so so that t paper was tabled in the january and then in the april we said yeah let's have a go and then in the may we started planning it and then literally were 15 of us in a cafe in bristol uh it took a while to think of a name that the art team came up with the name in fact it was 25 step process and stuff. we nearly fell out over the name uh but it seems to have caught on and mickey cashtan who we work with as a movement who's coaching us on decentralizing said recently that movements aren't created they're invited into being and there was something i think with extinction rebellion that was really waiting to to come and i think we tapped into a zeitgeist yeah beautiful and, and I'm, I'm i'd love to hear more about the decentralization and also what you've learned about leadership you said at the beginning that you know you failed in a way well maybe failure maybe learnings whatever but what, what what would you say are some of the key learnings if we were to apply your experiences of running these social enterprises and campaigns what have you what have you what would you distill as the essence of the learnings around leadership for you i, I mean some of some of it for me is really personal like i think it's common amongst those of us that use the label activist and it's not a term many of us enjoy actually and some people use terms like change maker and i found it even more strange but um th th there can be something in that field if you like in that way which brings forwards it's not like less anger but in my in my case like passive aggression <laughs> aggression or something it, there's been a part of myself that wanted to tell people off and tell people what to do uh, I don't think that was all that was going off, but I, I, so some of that just needs dealing with because it's not okay, you know, it's not going to work either. So there can be that individual journey. And a lot of what I think I do with my leadership as a woman is, and lots of women will talk about this in the way of a weaving and, and the, a dear colleague, Tiana, uh, we call her the spider queen of the rebellion. She's a, a weaver of webs. So a lot of women's leadership is not necessarily out there like up front. I mean, that happens sometimes, but it's um, making relationships with people, understanding them, uh, understanding the feeling of the, of the network that we're building and trying to help that person find their way in and their place there with their gifts and what they want to bring and their capacities. And like, it's a very... Uh, in some ways soft and that doesn't mean that women don't bring a ferocity i mean and i'm a mother of two boys 10 and 13 there's a ferocity there's not having this you know when women uh, face the grief of these times you know the, another part of women's leadership and just before this call actually being on a call with a dear colleague is is the grieving mm -hmm. is the grieving so that's um that's part of the leadership the inner piece of the work i think um the uh, the other learnings were literally um that there's a lot in social science about how things change so my experience over the years is that you see an issue uh whether it's a corrupted economic system or uh, environmental destruction or an agricultural policy that doesn't work or whatever and then somebody in the world's presenting a solution you know amazing solutions like the tax justice network know what to do about tax inequalities or uh, polly higgins's work around missing law ecocide law you know lots of good solutions so pro and, and and it's kind of like it can get a little <clears throat> Like, oh, really bad problem. Oh, amazing solution. If only everybody knew about this solution. That's not how things change, is knowing about solutions, in my experience. You know, so, so the study of how things change is, is uh, being led by people like, um, well, the father of civil resistance is Jim Sharp. And his uh, thoughts and, 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 and information around you know bringing down dictators and so on has been translated into 80 different languages it's been a key part of many social changes across the world <clears throat> so you've got people like that and then the kind of you know obviously what gandhi and martin luther king did and then there's been a lot of uh, modern day studies people like tim g with counterpower and um this is an uprising by the englers you know lots of literature out there uh, Roger Hallam, who I met 
was doing a studies at King's College and um, a PhD at King's College on how things change and so I had a lot of information as well so there's just basically you know social science about how things change. So I know this is going to sound like a huge question but if you say this this is not how things change by identifying a problem and a solution how I well maybe we can make it more specific then because I was going to say how do things change but how are you working with change? Like what's, what's the model that you're working with in Extinction Rebellion? And you also talked about decentralization. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So, so <clears throat> come back to the decentralization because it's a slightly different point and it's relevant. But the, um, so when there's a solution and you tell people about the solution, that's really cool. That's the consciousness raising step of the change process. But the way Tim G says it is there's four C's. There's um, raising consciousness and then coordinating across different groups who are working on that problem. Like there's like movement ecology, people have different roles. Uh, there's a confrontation step where you have to say enough, we're not having this anymore. And that's where the civil disobedience is relevant. And then it's really important, to, and, and also Jean Sharp talks about this, you have to have a, a, a consolidation. So it's been a mistake of many uh, movements to say we want to take down this dictator, but actually what they want is a functioning democracy and they have to be ready to make sure that gets implemented. The confrontation stage is really crucial. You know, Douglas Adams, I think it was said, uh, uh, I'm going to get it wrong here, the quote, but it's, you know, change, nothing changes without a demand, you know, that people aren't going to give up the, the power and the privilege they have without there being a a forceful demand and, and so you have then political commentators like Hannah Arendt that say the power lies in the collective so we often give away our power and think oh it's in Westminster or it's in the media or it's these nasty corporations or whatever it actually lies with the people and it's how to what extent we consent and so you know a key bit of Extinction Rebellion has been spell breaking to use that language we declared ourselves in active rebellion we said the social contract is broken the government's job when you consent to democracy and you don't always get the government you want and all the policies you want but you consent to democracy on the basis that they keep you safe uh, and that they are providing a future you know and that's basically the job of a parent as well in a micro level with your own children and the government if you're gonna allow it to have this parental role has to be keeping you all safe and providing well it's not that the governments of the world are not doing that right now and so the social contract's broken and that it doesn't matter where you sit on the political spectrum whether you're really left-leaning or right-leaning right-wing commentators you've got uh, Locke or Hobbes will talk about the the, the duty of uh, rebellion yeah, or the duty of, of rising up against your government if it's not doing its job, which it's not. I mean, I think if anybody looks at the science of what's happening uh, and the policies that aren't meeting even the Paris targets, uh, the commitments people made at Paris don't even get us within anything like the safe agreement. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit more then about how you organize the, the, this decentralization how you enable that how how extinction rebellion is led or not led like what's what what kind of an organization is it sure sure so having read uh things like this is an uprising and they've looked at how social movements work they talk about bringing together the structure-based organizing tradition which is more like what trade unions would do and melding that with the uh, mass protest um org tradition which is what gandhian and, and Luther King did uh, to great effect. So why that works um, is because you've, you've taken the time to really build uh, people's knowledge and information, but then you have these big moments of coming together, you need the two together. Uh, the other thing you have to do is you what's called front load a movement with DNA, so that what is this movement about, so people can be really clear. So in, in, in uh, Rising Up, we brought over the 10 principles and values into Extinction Rebellion. One of them is that we're nonviolent. That's just basically the, the, the deal. Um, if you want to be involved and you want to uh, go around punching people in the face, then you, you, you know, you're not, well, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> do what you want in, in somewhere else. That's not up to me, but it, it, part of Extinction Rebellion, nonviolence. Um, and also we say we're above the ground so that if you commit an act of civil disobedience, you stand by it. And I mean, literally stand by and wait for the police to come and get arrested and so on. Um, and there are eight other principles and values that go through them all. So you say what you are, 
and then uh, if people are signed up to those principles and values they can act as extinction rebellion without permission so they don't need to be you know allowed to be extinction rebellion they can just just get on with it in actual fact we have to sort of think about that in terms of when people want to constitute as a group so any three people could get together and organize a protest um but it, we need, we're needing to think again about what that means to be extinction rebellion in uk or scotland or um you know germany or indonesia whatever uh, so that's so that's part of it. That's the, that's the sort of basics of decentralisation is to, if to say what it is and then people can take it and run with it. And I guess to an extent Occupy was like that, but Occupy was seen at least as just being one tactic and one uh, piece of information. You know, we are the 99% so, uh, and talking about inequality. And so we, we wanted a much broader toolbox of tactics and um, a, a stronger message. And so I think, you know, lots, lots has been learned from previous social movements. And then, and then beyond that, we are aiming, and it's, a, it's an aspiration, I wouldn't say we're there, but to be what you might call a teal organisation in, in, in the sort of spirit of Frederick Lalou's work and, and spiral dynamics. Uh, so you're nodding, so maybe I have to explain more about that. But what but that not for me, but for other people who are listening, it might be good to give a little uh, snapshot of what you mean by teal. Yeah, so... so my understanding of that is that there are different types of consciousness that are in us all so the the, the hungry person has to be met it's quite kind of reptilian isn't it or the that the part of us that that's scientific and into logic or the part of us that's into family and and teams and um and these these different layers of consciousness are given uh, commas um the green progressive left is uh one of the kind of layers that, that emerged, I think maybe in the 60s, I'm not sure, spiral dynamics research would tell people about this and um, it's into sort of the environment and pluralism and so on. But actually, and I would say this of myself and people I've known that mean, we could just very narcissistic, actually. You know, that's what Ken Wilber talks about and it's all been about us and there can be a lot of judgment a lot of criticism and blaming and shame and energy in that layer so the teal layer is the next layer and in that layer there's something it is actually one of our principles and values no shame and blaming uh, in that teal layer it's seen the value of other uh, consciousnesses and, and, and recognizing and honoring them and um, and then practically what it's about is, um, I, as I understand it, so businesses can be mapped onto those consciousnesses as well, from a mafia-led organisation to an organisation that's trying to maximise its profit to the kind of corporate social responsibility meme and so on. Um, there, there are businesses that have emerged that are purpose, very much purpose-led, and I think that's absolutely the shift that's needed in, in the business sector, is the purpose is first, not the profit. So you have to change the finance system off the back of that. It's fine if you profit, if you because your profit's going to get reinvented, invent, invested to your purpose. So a teal organisation would have three aspects to it. One is that you can bring your whole self to that organisation. And in um, Extinction Rebellion, we talk about regenerative culture that people need to do the inner work. And I talked about that earlier. You know, what what am I bringing to this that's not helping? So go off and do your practices, your therapy, your yoga, your meditation, whatever, to sort yourself out, understand projection, and drama triangles, and all the stuff that gets in the way, and work on anti-oppressive practice and so on. So there's the, that, that aspect. Um, there's another that's about evolutionary purpose, you know, so Extinction Rebellion at the minute has its focus on, really, I think it's on democracy. Uh, but that purpose may, the, the movement may get to a point and then just, fade and go because it's done its thing or it may have it it may merge into something else and it's not for us to say certainly not for any leadership to say it's like sense in what that vision is that comes and then the third thing is about being self-organizing so we have um, a self-organizing system team that's the more sort of practical side i guess is um i mean all the other things have got practical sides as well but with that one it's how do we um organize so that teams so some some people think decentralized means that you know there's no power bases well i you know i take charge with others of the finance and fundraising teams together and 
you know, so that's our remit at a UK level. And uh, we, we, we get to decide, you know, because we couldn't have like everybody deciding um, uh, until somebody comes up with some really cool blockchain technologies and we can, we can do it that way. But for now, there's a, there's a team and then there's another team that decides on the focus for the region culture team and there's a, a you know, so on. So, um, so there are just practices that we use within that to try and teach ourselves how to self-organize and there are there is what's called an anchor circle that makes yeah. some pan movement decisions at the minute and you know we're really wrestling i mean we've, we've we're, we're working with some people who understand homocracy very well if people want to look up that it's a, it's a form of decision making where you you get you know, empowered to make a decision but ask for advice and feedback from the right people but within that it's, it's quite tricky because this thing's not an organization, it's a network and it's spreading locally. You know, there's about 120 groups in the UK and it's spreading internationally. So it, it's, a, it's an expanding thing. And how to involve the right people in the right decisions is, is quite a head spin at times. I can imagine. Yeah, but it's great that you have a map anyway, or at least a model that, that from the work of Frederick Lalu and others that, that supports you and all that. I wonder if we could also look at the remit because you said, you know, you kind of pulled out of, 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 of uh, the previous iteration into Extinction Rebellion, just the, the focus on climate change. And of course, some, many people would say, well, you can't really deal with climate change without dealing with you know, the global economic system and the geopolitical realities and, and many other things, too. So how do you how do you kind of straddle that paradox in a way because you've got a, a particular focus but it's nested in a in a much more complex set of, of interconnected sure. challenges and we talk about the climate and ecological crisis actually because you know we're, we're stuffed even if we could get rid of all the excess of carbon in the atmosphere we're stuffed because of the biodiversity loss that we're creating so it's it's very much needs to be seen as a whole I would say very much that that's um, this is more in the rising up materials, but um, the, the ecological crisis is created by, in particular, a, a fake democracy and non, a non-functioning democracy, a, a, a broken toxic economic system and a toxic media. So in, in the language of Gene Sharp, they, they would be the three pillars holding this yeah. system in place. And then I think that there's a that, that there's a you know a malaise underneath that which some would name as the patriarchy but it's about this idea that we're in scarcity that we're there's not enough abundance around which doesn't make sense in nature where everything's recycled and, and, re, and reused you know. that there's a sense of separation that you and i are in competition with each other and that we're not together when in in reality robin you're my brother you know you're my family and and what's that's good for me and then um powerlessness that there's nothing that we can do that, that, that we're there's this this is this, this machinery so there's a deeper piece you know with the system sitting on top um, and on, on the face of that i would say that extinction rebellion is pointing its arrow at because you need to just take out one pillar at a time really as i understand it's currently pointing its arrow at democracy okay um, and to an extent the media because we have taken on the media and we've become our own media so our our, our um, motto if you like is tell the truth and ask people to act accordingly which is part of emergency mode messaging but it's tell you know tell the truth and also which part of that truth is ch change can still happen still possible right uh act people ask people to act accordingly but we, you're focused on democracy because our we have three demands one is for the government to tell the truth and work alongside the media to to really tell people what's happening. The second is the, you know, a, a rapid decarbonisation of the economy and a reduction in consumption to deal with the ecological overshoot, the biodiversity loss. The third one is that how we go about doing those things, the policies we have is decided by a citizens assembly and um, they've been used before. They're, you choose people by sortition and a kind of jury and experts come and tell them what the situation is and what the possible changes are and they decide. So. That's really, we're essentially saying that governments are incapable of coming up with the policies. It needs people to get in a room and make these decisions. 
Yeah, fantastic. I mean, we're recording this at the time where the whole Brexit fiasco is, is, is playing out. And I think a Citizens Assembly might be one way forward for that too. It's been suggested. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't think there's much take up of it, but it's a, it's a good idea, I think. Mm. So I wonder if we could talk a bit about the nature of what you and others are willing to sacrifice and what we all maybe need to sacrifice in order to bring about the changes that we're talking about. I mean, I, I think I'm right in saying you've already spent some time in jail and, and certainly other people around you will need to spend time in jail in order to, because you believe in what you're doing and that's sometimes the cost and the price that we need to pay. And we will all need to pay a price. We will all need to sacrifice a lot in order to bring about the changes that are needed. And I wonder if you could just talk with us a bit about sacrifice. Sure, sure. I mean, I've been arrested a few times. I'm up in court, I, think, I believe, on the 16th of April next. Uh, some colleagues went to jail for a, a week as part of some air pollution campaigning. Um, my understanding of that word sacrifice is it comes from the word sacred, I think. I, so sacrifice, if you're not careful, sounds like some martyrish type, you know, which could come from an unhealthy part of yourself. I have this feeling that of the sacredness of life and I think actually Wendell in fact I can give you the quote here when Wendell Berry I think said something like there are there are no um there are no unsacred places there are only sacred places and desecrated places huh. and and, and so, so I'm, I'm going to pull this together in a minute but there's there's also you know, terror management theory, how, how people deal with how they feel about death and dying as individuals. And so much in their system can be set up to get you to avoid those feelings, you know, consumerism being a really obvious one, but it can be like fundamentalist and so on. And then there's, there's something that's possible where, uh, and I think it's well known, indigenous cultures hold, hold this, where you have a bigger sense of life and that life is sacred and that you have a, a part for the time that this version of you is alive you know i feel myself sometimes the best i was just in ceremony this weekend but you know the, the strongest part i feel of myself sometimes is is, uh, is as a manifestation of life you know it's not mm -hmm. it's just this boring uh, this version of me is a dick a lot of the time i mean <laughs> i'm glad when she's moved on but so there's ancestors and and they need to be honored you know they're not, and that there are the children to come after us and we're not we're just in this lineage and when you feel like that it's a service to life that's necessary so it's not you know so sacrifice is honoring what's sacred uh yeah. and um in that way you know of course we'll all die at some point so if i need to die in service to this process then it's i'm at peace with that yeah. <laughs> maybe not you know yeah. I want to you know i'm not intending to and i've got children to raise but the what what i'm what i'm really trying to say is look at the look at the nature of this crisis the the possibility of human extinction in our children's lifetime and the extinction events that are happening really feel it and then ask yourself what you're going to do about it and if the social science says as i can tell you it does but do your own research that civil disobedience is needed I mean, you know, for so many of us with so many privileges in, 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 in Western democracies, especially uh, democracies, especially, um, it's not that big a deal getting arrested, to be honest. I wouldn't say that to somebody if they're having mental health issues and you might not mm -hmm. get such an easy ride if you're uh, a black person. Uh, you know, the, I'm not being naive here, but essentially I, I find it quite restful <laughs> some hours in the cell. And I find it quite amusing. If I'm really honest. I don't find it. I find it, it appeals to a cheeky and possibly even slightly sexual side. I think it's um, a root energy. You know, it's it's not. Uh, I think I think you know. And if you're saying this system, this this industrialized m machine that we're part of is is not what we want anymore. I, do you really mean that? Have you had enough of it? Because I have. And if you've had enough of it, what are you going to do about it? You know, because if you feel like you can't break the law, well, the law is part of this machine at the minute. We don't have the laws that we should have in place. So if you really mean it, 
break the law, you know, break them. And I want to say break the law. I mean, get on the streets, mm -hmm. you know? get on the streets. And that, it, the, 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 the revolutions that have happened in other countries, and this is a revolution of the heart as well as, you know, uh, I think it's neoliberal, neoliberalism as a form of dictatorship because you vote in this country, you vote in for a version of neoliberalism, right? Unless you're voting for a fringe party. But uh, if, if you want to see that end, what they do in other countries, they get on the streets and stay there. And from April 15th, that's where we're going to be on the streets of the capitals. Um, and um, we'll be in London my, myself. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to join us. That's the, that's the message. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and what I can also feel like when you said it, there's a sense of peace if you're in the jail cell or, or wherever, but there's also a sense of peace when you know you're doing what you're meant to be doing. Like if, if you, if you, like you say, if you see something clearly and you're willing to really look at it clearly and then you know what you need to do and you do that, there's a sense of well-being that comes from that, even if the outer is responding to you in, in critical ways or doing other things. No. There's, there's a process that I've noticed that people need to go through and maybe it's not everybody, but I think it probably is for many of us, is in facing, because I thought I'd face this thing, you know, I've locked myself in an arm tube outside a fracking site, like you said, incinerator so I've been there's some part of me that hadn't really faced this, you know, that uh, my own children are likely, highly likely to be growing up in a world that's, um, that, where society's collapsing. You know, David Attenborough's talked about the collapse of society, not just some fringe things that's been said. UN Secretary General's talked about human extinction as a possibility. They're going to be raised in that world. And what happens in a world like that is that fascism is likely to get a hold that wars, people are going to want to send them to wars and so on. And then the idea that life isn't going to continue. I mean, that we're, we're heating the planet to the same degree as happened during the Permian mass extinction event when 97% of all life went. You know, really breathe that in. It's a shock to really face that. Yeah. And I think there was something in the Green Movement that was saying, let's not really look at this. You know, I, to honour people that have worked in the Green Movement for many years, many were saying this is an emergency, but there'd been this idea it's best to be hopeful and it's best to not shock people and frighten people. Well, actually, let's be as shocked and as frightened as this is because that's when people step up. And then there's um, a process of grieving and shock that's not to be skipped over. That is part of the work. And we know that grief opens the space of love it's the price mm -hmm. that you pay for love and from love courage comes forwards and so you go through that process and you find your courage and you find your purpose and it's it is a beautiful thing yeah yeah and it relates to some of the other speakers in this series joanna macy will be talking to also she does of course a lot of work around grief and despair and jem bendel who's doing a lot of work around the nature of denial also and why we don't really look at it so I think we'll be picking up on some of those themes in some of the other the, the other podcasts. I wonder if we could we could close a bit with with you. You said at the beginning or earlier that there are organisations. I want to bring it a bit to the kind of corporate and organisational level and what you would say to the leadership of of corporates. And you said that there are organisations that are purpose led. You've mapped out the kind of teal style of organisation that you think meets the needs of the times. So two questions really. One is where are you seeing seeds of hope on a corporate level or a kind of international level or in the, both in terms of leadership and purpose and what would you want to say to the leaders of corporations today mm. yeah well i think certainly seeing the emergence of business that is purpose-led is, is deeply inspiring and you know business has figured out so much about how to get things done you know so so that's where there's the, probably the deepest hope is is that if that information was set towards the healing of the planet you know you think of those scientists at monsanto or the engineers in Halliburton or whatever if they were set to the purpose of i mean and also be a lot of land-based work that be done, by the way it's not all science and engineering but to the healing of the planet it would be incredible you know all those project managers and so on and mm -hmm. in in the you know i used to work in corporate social responsibility and I, I actually don't massively believe in it if i'm honest but um but what you do meet is a whole pile of good people i mean human beings are maybe there are the odd sociopaths around in business and, and other places but 
on the whole, they're just very, very beautiful people and they're stuck in institutions who are using their energies for a purpose that's not healthy. And you don't believe in CSR for what reason? What's your sense of that? Just so much of it is. Uh, yeah, there was a European study that said that the, the, the more a company, there was a direct correlation between CSR reporting and tax dodging. Uh, you know, comp co co don't tell me you've got good CSR and then not pay taxes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just yeah. sounds dumb. I mean, that's too, just often, too often it's a front. It's a kind of greenwashing and other kind of front. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then, you know, the CSR um, department in any business is, is, is generally full of wonderful people. And then the businesses will say, you know, they've got, they, they want work-life balance. And then you see these business folks that are run ragged and, there's these good intentions there but it's caught up in the machine it's caught up in the machine the machine that we're in is about converting nature into stuff and persuading people they need that stuff it's mad you know so you can't some corporations are set for a, um that what they're about is not needed and so they either have to you know they have to, have to go away <laughs> or they have to change into what's needed and really quickly. And I mean, the issue is the whole finance system, which you raised earlier, Robin, which is my, you know, pointing at democracy is one thing. I, my own personal view is that Extinction Rebellion or some other movement's gonna need to point at the economic system. And I would be massively in favor of a mass civil disobedience around finance and what that would look like is refusing to pay debts and taking money out of the system and refusing to give it back, you know, and putting it where it's needed. But we have to be very collectively sure of each other. I mean, just if, if anybody does do blockchain technologies out there, because I think you'd have to have people certifying, well, I'm going to refuse to pay my mortgage if like 10,000 other people do it. So you can press the go button and everybody's set up to go. I mean, I think that's what's going to be needed. I don't think this system is going to let go because it's a machine that's in, in, in operation. Uh, but you know, if you're a if you're a, a leader, it, I think it just depends on your very personal circumstances. But I think everybody, in my view, should question their own life. You have this one, as they say, wild and precious life, where you live in the adventure you want. And uh, my experience, and I know it's a bit of a hippie thing to say, but if you pray for and ask for guidance and offer yourself truly in service to something bigger than yourself, then the opportunity will come. And you have to be willing. I, I, I spent many years with my foot in a boat. I mean, I'm talking metaphorically here and the other foot still on the bank, trying to make it work that I stayed in the previous life and moved into a new one. And you, ha you have to get in the boat and go, you know, whatever that means for that individual, whether it means leaving that job, if you'll know that you're not doing what serves, re reorganizing your life so that you can have less debt and you can focus on what you need to be doing. Yeah, it's beautiful. I don't have so many other things to ask you. Actually, I feel very touched by many of the things that you've said. And I think this, this whole kind of what you just said just now feels to me like a definition of what I would call sacred activism. Mm. So, so, you know, we, we kind of bow down to, to something greater than us and offer ourselves in service. And then we know what we need to do in the world. So it's not either or it's, it's bringing the two together. Mm. Um, just maybe one last question about, about where you see beyond your own movement, but where would you see the seeds of real hope at the moment? Like what, are, what might be two or three things you think that's going really well and that's going really well? And where, 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 where is the turning starting to happen? Or is it starting to happen? I, I, we just have a, a real problem with the word hope in, um, in Extinction Rebellion. We, so we've got one of our slides says hope dies, action begins. And um, Derek Jensen, who's a, a deep green activist, uses the word hopium. There's something about yeah. feeling hopeful that's quite pacifying. Oh, hope, hopefully that will sort it out. You know, so I'm not, I'm not a great one for feeling, feeling as with with hope your, your own hope is internal isn't it it's kind of in it you know joe you mentioned joanna macy who's written a book called active hope mm -hmm. uh, we use joanna macy in the her work um the work that reconnects in, as part of the regenerative culture but the, the the hope comes from doing so that's where the hope is is right. every every person 
that is willing to step forwards and yeah okay so just to answer your question properly though i mean the hope i see is the the waking up that is happening that it's it's happening upon on on a big scale i mean i think daniel pinchbeck wrote about this um that the facing of this collective trauma is 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 likely to lift us is you know has that possibility of fans of, do, of doing the great turn and again that joanna and other people talked about um so in in, in in many ways people are, are, are awakening people forwards and the what I think we have to do is, and again, Charles Eisenstein talks about this, you have to, you have to be the reminder for each other because we're all glitching and out of the matrix, aren't we? And out of the denial that Jen Bendel talks about. You know, you have to <laughs> you just do the work and then reconnect. Do the work and reconnect with other people. Yeah. Remember that, you know, where the sanity and then the insanity lies. The cycle. Yeah, thank you. I think we're at our time now. So thank you so much, Gail. It's been a really great time to spend with you. I feel very both touched and inspired. And I'll check where I am on April 15th. And maybe I'll see you in the streets. But it's been a it's it's great. And just want to really wish you every success in all the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of, of all of us and on behalf of humanity. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.